Okay viewers, today's big question is what's the future of human evolution? Uh, in the fullness of time, in a couple of million years, what will humans look like? What will they be like? How will we evolve? And uh, I'm actually going to try and tell you exactly what we're going to be like uh, in a few million years. I'm going to tell you what the future of my evolution, your evolution is uh, for sure. A classic uh, kind of like backstory statement. Now, the best thing to do with this is probably to go right back to the beginning. If you go to the Bay of Sharks in Western Australia, you'll find there's a very saline landlocked lagoon. And in the lagoon, there are these strange globular uh, columns. And if you look very carefully, you'll notice there are little bubbles rising off the columns. Uh, because the columns are not rocks, or they are rocks, um, but they're covered in a very thin film uh, of creatures, uh, which are called um, stromatolites. And stromatolites are the basic form of life that first appeared on Earth uh, very, very early on in its history. Um, it's a very interesting place, because these creatures have been with us uh, for three and a half billion years. They're extraordinarily simple. Um, they're prokaryote cells, single-celled organisms. Their DNA is unbounded by a nucleus and just floats around freely. And all the stromatolites appear to be able to do uh, is release oxygen and fix um, calcium into the form of these globular columns. So the columns themselves are actually created by uh, the stromatolites. They're the reason we have an oxygen-rich atmosphere, because they've created it. Um, and all they sit, do is sit there and, and bubble away nice and quietly. There have been stromatolites in the universe for a full quarter of its entire lifespan. So 25% of the time from the Big Bang to now, these things have been with us. And everything on Earth, from the plants, the animals, is all descended from stromatolites, the creatures very similar to them, prokaryote um, cyanobacteria, uh, basically. Now if you went back, um, right back to the beginning and you try to theorise what each stromatolite would become. Undoubtedly one of these stromatolites would be the progenitor of uh, the dinosaurs, another would be the progenitor of the oak tree, another one would be our uh, distant ancestor. And considering the varying paths that evolution can take, it's very hard to say exactly what will become uh, of any living thing um, in the fullness of time. Now, it's not hard to think of ways in which human beings could improve uh, our sense of smell, for instance, is lousy. Uh, a sniffer dog can detect a tin of pal at the bottom of a lake and will bark when the boat goes over the top of the tin of pal, which is just absurd. Um, an eagle can pick out a rabbit as it flies over a landscape from you know, a couple of hundred feet and drop down straight on it. Um, bears have a sense of smell that's even better than dogs. So we know that bears don't like sauerkraut. Uh, and the reason for that is, is that when bears break into huts uh, in the American wilderness, they leave the tins of sauerkraut and they bite into all the other tins. Now a tin is, is hermetically sealed, there's no gas escaping from it at all, um, but it turns out that during the canning process and the boiling process that follows, tiny little bits of um, sauerkraut are trapped under that rolled rim. Enough for many years later, the bears go, sauerkraut, no thanks. So it's not as if human beings have reached the kind of apogee of uh, what, can be, uh, what can be done. We're miles behind in terms of physicality, we're weak, uh, we're badly armoured, we're hairless, which you know, kind of has its advantages and disadvantages. Um, and so it's obvious that there are plenty of ways in which we could improve. Another way in which we could improve, there's actually a sixth sense, if you like, which we don't have at all. Um, if you go to Australia um, and you go into a, a muddy pool, you might find duckbill platypus. And the duckbill platypus, adorable little creature, and it goes around at the bottom of the pool and it hunts for, for other living creatures in this uh, completely um, kind of like sensory deprived environment. The way it does it is it has electro receptors all over the front of its uh, bill and it can actually pick up the tiny electrical signals generated by the beating hearts of little creatures that it wishes to eat and it can find them in the dark. So in terms of our senses, they're poor in comparison to other senses, and there are other senses that we lack uh, completely. So in the fullness of time, could it be that our senses would become more acute? Could it be that we get stronger? Or could it be that we acquire uh, electroreceptibility? Um, and considering that the brain uh, works by sending electrical signals, and the original eyes that appeared on Earth are very simple, but now obviously they're very complex, who knows where that could take you? You could uh, discern quite a lot. Um, about what a person is thinking or feeling if you had electroreceptors that were finely enough attuned. There's all kinds of information that we're unaware of. So dogs famously sniff each other's bums uh, in order to find out whether the dog is receptive uh, to mating. Imagine all the money you could save. Um, 
So there's plenty of things that humans could do uh, a lot better. There's also the area in which we are undoubtedly the front runners, which is that we're clever in comparison to other animals. We're extraordinarily clever. Um, but even amongst our super clever species, uh, we have people who are cleverer still. We have Einsteins, we have Beethovens, we have the various geniuses, we have the people who are particularly good at things. And if we evolved to be Einsteins, all of us, there would be undoubtedly people who rose uh, higher still. And so it's very hard to know, with such a broad range of possibilities going forward, exactly which path we would choose to take, or not choose to take, which path we would be carried along. Unless, unless. Now, let's go back to the base sharks. So they are our stromatolites and they're all bubbling away and they've been there for three and a half billion years, which is a hell of a long time. And some of those stromatolites or their distant descendants have turned into us, building boardwalks and looking at them and buying stuff in the gift shop. But some of them are still stromatolites. They haven't actually gone anywhere in the whole period of life evolving on Earth, there have been no change in some stromatolites, and they're still stromatolites. Crocodiles uh, jumped off uh, the evolutionary kind of conveyor belt about 250 um, million years ago. Jellyfish jumped off even earlier. So it's clear from looking at the creatures that surround us that evolution is not a river carrying all living things forward to better and better things. It's actually full of eddies, it's full of side lanes, things get washed up on the bank, um, and the vast proportion, the vast majority of living things uh, on Earth today, even with our um, kind of insatiable ability to kind of breed and fill it up, are non-human. They're creatures who haven't progressed any further. You still have grass, um, which raises an interesting question: Why have some creatures evolved, and why have other creatures not evolved? How do you get off? Uh, the evolutionary uh, bandwagon and what is it that makes you stay on. So what we're going to have a quick look at is what are the driving forces behind human evolution, not any evolution. So the way that evolution works is like this. You have variation within a species. If each stromatolite was only able to make a copy of itself, they don't reproduce sexually, they just make a copy, and those copies were always identical, the world would still be dominated by stromatolites. There would be nothing else because all they would do is spawn another stromatolite. But what happens is, because a stromatolite is a single-celled organism, that every now and again, uh, a little bit of uh, leftover radiation from the Big Bang, an alpha particle, comes zooming through space and it goes straight through a stromatolite and it knocks a little bit off its, uh, off its little DNA strip. Um, that damages the DNA and it changes uh, what the stromatolite is, if you like, into something else. And if that stromatolite survives the hit, it then starts to self-replicate as a different form of life uh, from what it was before. This form of evolution from background radiation is particularly useful for single-celled organisms because, of course, it's only one cell, it only has one strand of DNA, and so every change that's made to that DNA is a str change to the entire organism. Uh, if an alpha particle zooms through space, as they do all the time, and they pass through me, as they are doing right now, and it knocks a little bit off one of my DNA strands, uh, there are two paths that the cell could take. The first is that the cells around it could recognise that it was different, gobble it all up and you know, reuse its constituent parts to make proper healthy cells. Uh, or, uh, more rarely, but over the course of a lifetime, you know, kind of quite likely, it turns cancerous and starts to go off on a frolic of its own, uh, self-replicates on nobody's business into a tumour and kills me. And so it's not really a great way uh, for multi-celled organisms uh, to, to mutate and to change over time. There is one period in our lives, very, very short period, where we can uh, kind of successfully alter due to cosmic uh, radiation, and that's when you're a zygote. So your mother's sperm, your father's egg meet together, and for a very brief moment uh, in your life, you will have been a single-celled organism, and that's the zygote, the one uh, cell, and if you're damaged by a cosmic ray at that point, there's a possibility that that cell will then self-replicate and become a human being uh, his variation from its parents is not due to the vagaries of sexual reproduction, it's actually due to uh, damage by um, cosmic background radiation. The main way in which creatures like us uh, evolve is through the vagaries of sexual reproduction. So, I for instance, am married to my wife, uh, Laura, 
And when we have children, those children are not like either of us. They're like us, but they're unlike us because they're a combination of both of our genes. And so what you'll find is that there's variation. Josh looks like me, but he's not me. Matthew looks more like Laura, but obviously not Laura. Probably guessed by the name. Um, and so you get variation. It's built into sexual reproduction that each generation is marginally different uh, from the last. And that tendency to change, that tendency to mutate, is the driving force of evolution. It's what allows things uh, to change over time. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Now, over a very, very long period of time, all of these little changes and all of these little kind of uh, mutations, adaptations, and what have you, can build up to form a creature which is entirely new. So a theropod dinosaur can turn into a bird, which can then obviously famously turn into the chicken. Um, and it was Darwin who first realised the power of the sexual reproductive method when he was looking at fancy pigeons. So in the Victorian era, and still today, um, baffling to the non-enthusiast, is the creation of different types of pigeon. So what will happen is that pigeon fanciers uh, will create new forms of pigeon, pigeons with different plumage, pigeons with different beak shapes, and they can sculpt them over time by selectively breeding together parents who have what they consider to be desirable attributes in order to create offspring who have similarly desirable attributes. And when Darwin observed this happening, he could see that there was really significant and obvious changes happening within the fancy pigeon population over a scale of time that a human could actually observe. And this is one of the first things that led him to think, well, perhaps without the human selecting, but with just the environment selecting, could you not therefore create a change in a species through natural as opposed to uh, unnatural selection? Look at dogs. We've got loads of different types of dog. Um, they're all descended from the wolf. They could all theoretically successfully breed together. <laughs> like a great Dane and Shitsi might have some trouble, but it's possible. And so human beings have managed to reach into the lives of other creatures and we've managed to speed up the evolutionary process. We've decided what outcome we want and we can make that dog, that wolf, into a spring spaniel or we can make that pigeon into a, into a fancy pigeon. So where man has a hand, evolution speeds up. You get new types of species and where man doesn't have a hand, evolution tends to go along at a snail's pace. Now, the reason why pigeons tend to stay pigeons without human beings interfering is because if you have a population of pigeons, let's say there's a hundred of them in your pigeon loft, and they're all basically rock doves with minor variations, and they interbreed in a kind of free love, willy-nilly kind of way for several generations, they just revert back to the mean. You'll have one offspring who has one specific thing, but then it will mate with another pigeon that doesn't have that specific thing, and so on and so on, and the gene pool of the loft remains intact. The contents, the genetic contents of the pigeon loft 10 breeding cycles later will be pretty much exactly the same as the genetic contents of the pigeon loft uh, 10 uh, generations before. So what is it that leads to this trap? How do animals fall into the trap? How do you get off the conveyor belt? How do you stay a crocodile? Well, the way that it works is like this. If you have a large and successful uh, population and the creatures in that population make it to breeding age because they're a successful format, if you like, for the niche that they're occupying, then this tendency to revert back to the mean keeps them the same. The crocodile stays as a crocodile because there's no selection pressure. It's an apex predator, there's nothing come along which can nearly really kick it off its perch, nothing places pressure on it, and so there's no selection. All the crocodiles have marginal differences, but by breeding with one another, um, all together if you like, they keep their genetic stock the same and they don't evolve. Um, in order for a creature to evolve, what you really need is you need the hammer of circumstance. You need a difficult environment where the creature is struggling and just as important as you need the anvil of death. The important thing is that not all of the creatures can make it. You have to have an environment in which crocodiles are struggling to survive, in which only the fittest make it through to breed, and they breed um, so successfully, and in the absence of the less successful alleles, that all of the generations that follow inherit only the genes of those few successful crocodiles, and the genes of the less successful crocodiles are lost uh, to the fossil record. If you want something to evolve, 
you need to put it under pressure. So if you drive a species to the brink of extinction, you'll find that your gene pool gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And as a result of the gene pool getting smaller and smaller and smaller, you'll get naturally what Darwin observed in the pigeon fanciers, which is that you get a lot of inbreeding. And inbreeding, fortunately for evolution, creates lots and lots of incidents of mutation. You're very much less likely to have a child with a genetic disease if you marry your cousin uh, than you are if you marry somebody um, from down the road, even less so if you marry somebody from another country. The more closely related you are to your mate, the more likely your offspring are to differentiate from the mean significantly. Unfortunately, this usually expresses itself as a negative. Most mutations are bad, but what it does mean is it increases the likelihood that you'll have a positive mutation, uh, a member of the species who has the necessary strengths to deal with the environment when others fail, and then all of the offspring that follow will be his offspring and the entire species will change. So inbreeding leads to an increased rate of mutation and the increased rate of mutation means that you have a far broader range of possible gene alleles to choose from for the next generation. The fact that you're inbreeding suggests that your population has been pushed back to a hound and dub, which means you're under a lot of situational pressure, which means that all of those weak products of inbreeding will be gobbled up by their predators or killed by pathogens or frozen to death by inclement weather, and only the strong will survive and move forward and as those few strong members survive and move forward, the species moves forward with them. If everyone survives, it doesn't matter who's fittest, you just revert back to the mean. And so the stromatolites of Shark Bay survive because Shark Bay is very heavily saline, which means that there are lots of other creatures who cannot stand it there. And because they can't stand it there, the environment isn't clement to them, and it's only clement to stromatolites. And the environment in Shark Bay is large enough for there to be a reasonably decent proportion population of stromatolites. They remain in stasis seemingly forever. They say they've been there uh, for the full life age of the Earth, unchanged. So, what does that mean uh, for us humans? Well, humans are a particularly evolution-proof species, and the reason being is that there are absolutely loads of us. There are eight billion humans on the planet, an absolutely colossal uh, gene pool uh, to choose from. We're moving more than other species. We tend to travel. Our chances of having a sexual relationship by accident with somebody who we don't know that we're related to are low. And indeed, as we travel more and more, the chances of that happening grow less and less. People from Skegness marry people from Boston. It's a complete free-for-all. And as a result, our incidence in mutation has been dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping as we've gone through history. It hasn't always been that way. The fact that there's so much variation between humans, you, know, you kind of have uh, you know, somebody from Iceland, for instance, looks nothing like somebody from the Torres Strait Islands, who looks nothing like somebody from Etar in Greenland, suggests that in the past, humans have been in this liminal, um, sundered, existence, that we've been clinging on in places where we found difficult to live and that we had to adapt and evolve. But then, when things get better and our technology improves, we then expand back outwards again, we meet other populations of human beings and we tend to interbreed with them, which means that we then revert back to the mean. Uh, human evolution, or following the human genome, seems to suggest that this has happened on a number of occasions. That man has spread out and then been sundered and hounded back to a nub, which has caused him to wish to mutate, or not wish to mutate, but has forced him to mutate. And then he's expanded back and met up with other human beings, interbred with them, reverted some way back to the mean, and then been sundered again. The other thing that makes us kind of evolution-proof is that we have a very rich genome. Um, we're the last surviving species of hominid, but there used to be many more. Um, so, for instance, the fact that I'm white uh, is a, actually a, a reflection of the fact that one of my uh, distant ancestors wasn't human at all. He was a Neanderthal, which is another species of hominid that lived in Europe um, you know, before and during the last ice age. And Neanderthals were very impressive creatures. They had larger brains than us. They probably spoke. They used fire and they wore clothes. And they were stronger than we are. They had white skin. Um, and some of the uh, Homo sapiens, the modern humans, if you like, who came out of Africa, found themselves in conflict with Neanderthals for the same uh, kind of uh, uh, stuff, same food, same girls to an extent. Uh, and we adapted, or we didn't adapt, we actually uh, acquired a number of their traits. So there are a number of traits that are associated with Neanderthal uh, lineage. One of them is white skin, obviously. Another one is strength. 
you might notice that the world's strongest man tends to be dominated in its latter stages by people from Scandinavia. You know, they generally tend to be Caucasian, and it does seem as if we've inherited a certain amount of beef uh, from our Neanderthal ancestors. Oddly, a fondness for cigarettes as well, although don't ask me why that is. Um, in the Far East, you have the Denisovans, who are another form of hominid, who make up a significant proportion of the genome uh, of people from Far East Asia. So you have a genome uh, which is very widely spread, uh, which is very successful wherever it goes, and it actually has a certain amount of uh, kind of like reinvigoration, a kind of hybrid vigour from mixing with other um, hominid species. But despite the fact that we are all different in so far as you know, I'm white, and other people are black, and other people are brown, and other people are Eskimos, and all the rest of it, um, we are still all human. So these are peripheral differences. They're not enough to actually change us as a species. We can all breed together successfully. Um, and we can have viable offspring. So even though human beings do appear to show a local variation, it's not species variation. We are all um, the same, in fact, uh, underneath it all. So we're doing very well. Uh, we've managed to evolve to the stage where we basically stamped out all of our predators. We've also mercilessly exterminated all of our fellow hominids. I think it's very unlikely that Neanderthal man is no longer with us uh, because of environmental changes. I have no doubt that he was at least partially hounded to extinction um, by Homo sapiens uh, with all the kind of violence and sexual violence that that entails. 5% of uh, Europeans' DNA is Neanderthal. Um, we have conquered uh, many of our pathogens and the pathogens that come along, so COVID-19, we deal with in remarkably quick time. We're not talking about evolutionary periods of time, you know, it's dealt with in a year and a half, we have a vaccine, and even if we'd allowed that disease to run its course, we would have actually have lost very few people, certainly not enough uh, to put pressure on our genome. So in this uh, format of evolution, Instead of evolution being viewed, as I know some people view it, as this kind of conveyor belt carrying species forward towards completion, what it really is, is a form of insurance. It's when you take a species and you grind it back until there's almost nothing left, it suddenly starts to try out other options. Its genome starts to branch off in all kinds of different directions through inbreeding and through a lack of a, a mean to revert to. And it's that that drives evolution. It's almost certainly the case that the branch of uh, life which evolved most recently, and that's the one with us on the end, with one of the newest creatures on the planet, it's only 200,000 years of man uh, on Earth, it is the one that has been founded to extinction the most often, almost close to extinction the most often. Unlike the stromatolites of Shark Bay, we've clearly been on the edge of the precipice many, many times, which has forced us uh, to evolve or has led to the circumstances which allow us uh, to evolve. And that's not really that surprising. The truth of the matter is, is that the competition for surviving on Earth isn't much about brains. And most of the time it hasn't been about brains at all. It's been about brawn. Until you're clever enough to realise that you can throw something from where you are and hit something where it is, or with a rock, for instance, or something along those lines, you still have to grapple with your predators and your prey creatures by hand. You have to attack them in the same way as a lion would attack them. Even chimpanzees, who occasionally obviously throw poo, um, don't actually use missile weapons and to a certain extent it's hard to see what advantage uh, a brain bestows on a creature before it gets to the stage at which you can actually utilize tools and technology it's just a ridiculous energy hungry lump inside of its head that doesn't make it any more likely to fight, to survive in a fist fight with a kind of you know the komodo dragon or any other kind of stupid but better armed um, monster but whatever the environment that has led to us uh, developing a large brains and the chances are it's being um, trapped in a small community uh, where it's actually interspecies competition, um, not interspecies, rather competition between other humans that drives brain development rather than competition with other animals. We appear in recent years, 200,000 of them, to have crossed the Rubicon. We've moved from being part of the environment we're in to being somehow separate from it our ability to make clothes, our ability to make weapons, our ability to make fire and to build shelters for ourselves has separated us from the other creatures of our world. It's meant that larger, stronger creatures can be ganged up on, stabbed to death with stone-tipped spears. It's meant that environments which we wouldn't otherwise survive, we can all sit around singing songs and kind of eating seal blubber pancakes in an igloo because we have the ability to make these structures that make our lives possible. And interestingly enough, wherever you go in the world, 
you can find humans who are almost everywhere. So if you go to the wastes of Northern Greenland, you'll find people there. And they're perfectly happy. They're living a life that suits them. They have the technology they need to survive. If you go to the Sahara Desert, you'll find a guy sitting on a camel, kind of herding goats, whatever it is that he's doing. He's also perfectly happy. It suits him down to the ground. Um, it's his natural cultural environment. There are very few of us living in the West, for instance, in Britain, uh, who secretly wish that we could be back in the Rift Valley being kind of scorched by the equatorial sun. We all belong where we are in a way that other animals don't seem to belong where we are. We push them out. And so with this extraordinary brain, We've managed to reach a stage where it's very hard to put us under pressure. It's very hard to wear us down, push us back to that hounded nub that will evolve more quickly. We're breeding generally with people with whom we are not closely related, which knocks our incidence of mutation absolutely flat. And because we are empathic, and when we see other creatures suffering, not even our own species, but other creatures you know, particularly of our own species, we don't think, brilliant, here's an opportunity for me to stamp out a weaker competitor and have sex with his wife in order to make sure that their children are not his but mine. We run to their defence. And as a result, it means that the vast majority of modern humans make it to breeding age and they successfully breed. Not only do they do that, but they successfully breed as successfully as more what you might call successful and in inverted commas human beings. A brain surgeon has two children, as does the plumber, as does uh, the chap from the Maasai Mara. Um, we're no longer being rewarded for our success in life with greater breeding success. We actually tend to uh, choose quality over quantity. So what we'll do is we'll marry one woman, or we'll certainly reproduce with the one woman, and then we'll have a few children and we'll try to make sure that those children have the best possible chance in life rather than the old fashioned way, which is you just have as many as you can um, you know, in the knowledge that the attritive forces of life will grind them away and that of your original 10, only five, if you like, will make it to adulthood. So in the current human environment, it's very hard to imagine human beings actually evolving at all. We don't mutate very much. If we do mutate, it then reverts back to the mean because we have this enormous uh, kind of body uh, of genetic stock to choose from. We travel broadly and most people uh, make it to breeding age and successfully breed. If somebody does have a problem, we tend to help them rather than do what animals would do. And I know we like to think of animals in a kind of you know, nice friendly way, but they're pretty vicious and you know, like generally speaking, they'll stamp out their competitors and, and, and hop on their, on their wives. And as a result, it means that not only are we not mutating, but we're not selecting for what you might consider to be successful mutations. No one is dying anymore. The anvil of death has been removed, and to a certain extent, our brains have even removed uh, the hammer of circumstance. As a result, if things continue in the way that they are, it's unlikely that humans will evolve much further. We'll be like the crocodile, or we'll be like uh, the jellyfish, or the stromatolite and we'll be in stasis, we'll be in an environment in which we can survive easily, in which we can breed easily, in which we interbreed uh, successfully, and in which mutation is kept at rock bottom. Any mutations are washed out by reversion back to the mean. In fact, my mum never tires of mentioning how often a very tall man will actually seem to deliberately select a rather short wife, um, as if reversing back to the mean was something which our brains actually wish to happen. The height difference between my wife and I is 17 inches, for instance, I'm taller. Um, and so there almost seems to be a, a desire to choose a mate who doesn't share your outlandish cap you know, your, you know, your outlying um, oddities, but has the opposite. In order that your children will revert back to the mean, have a certain degree of hybrid rigor, and be better able to survive on the planet. So with that being the case, what we'd have to do is think, well, what might cause us to evolve, what might actually pose a significant threat to our survival as a species that would push us right the way back to the borderline of extinction in order to get that mutation rate up, in order to knock off all of the weaker members of our society so that only the strong survived and bred and that all of mankind from there on in would share their tropes and not ours. So let's think of a few of those things. The first one, and um, we're all a bit worried about global warming. So climate change, could climate change uh, start to force humans uh, to evolve uh, once again? And again, you have to evolve or change to the point at which you are no longer human. 
So people in Nepal have better blood vessels um, in their extremities as an adaptation for living at altitude. It's still human. People in uh, sub-Saharan Africa have lots of uh, melanin in their skin to stop them from burning, but they're still human. We're not talking about those little incremental surface changes, we're talking about species change. And if you want to know if you change species, you can no longer successfully mate with somebody who doesn't share your tropes. And we can, all humans can successfully mate together. We've seen it online. So, climate change. Um, it's supposed to be an enormous threat to us. Might it kick off human evolution? Well, for the reasons that I've already mentioned, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, the reason being is that humans appear to be able to survive in a whole range of different environments. Uh, the uh, Inuit, uh, not yeah, the Inuit in, um, in Etar and Greenland survive perfectly well as humans without any real changes to their basic blueprint, as do chaps uh, in the Sahara. Even runaway climate change of the sort that we're being told uh, to worry about now, where climate change happens extraordinarily fast, isn't something to worry about uh, in terms of survival of the species. The reason we know this is because of the empires uh, of the previous centuries. You could take a whole group of people from London, for instance, stick them on a boat and ship them off to Australia, a place that's completely different uh, in terms of climate, it's completely different in terms of solar radiation, you know, the crops that thrive there are not the same crops. And yet, within a few generations, they're arguably having more fun than we are. Um, and they haven't even really changed their culture that much. Their clothing is the same culture, uh, the same clothing that we wear, the language is the same, the farming methods they use, you know, the kind of the class combine harvester that um, does the fields in East Anglia or also does the fields in Australia. And so, even what you might call a catastrophic change in climate that happens within six weeks where you go from living somewhere cold and damp to somewhere hot and dry. Human beings adapt and survive straight away. Our brains allow us to turn on that sixpence. If the Earth's temperature increases significantly, yes, there are areas that become desertified and they'll become very hot. Um, I would argue possibly not too hot for human habitation because we seem to be able to live anywhere and we can live in space. Um, but at the same time as that happens, you'll find enormous tracts of land, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, in Siberia and Greenland and Northern Canada that become available for human use. There's no way that climate change is actually going to push uh, the amount of land on Earth, which is uh, kind of usable to humans with their enormous mental plasticity, back to the point where there's too few of them uh, to revert back to the mean in their breeding. So climate change um, may well cause us to have to adapt and indeed it may well cause a certain amount of friction during that adaptation process, but there's no real reason to suggest that it poses a threat to us uh, as a species. Um, diseases. Again, uh, with all diseases that we're aware of in the modern era, um, they, uh, there are always people who are immune. So AIDS uh, first uh, came out as a big deal in the 80s and 90s. Um, but very soon it became clear there were some people who, whilst they could have the AIDS virus, it didn't kill them. The same is true for people with coronavirus. It's a great example because it actually only affects a very small proportion of the population. It tends to be beyond breeding age anyway. If you had allowed coronavirus to run completely, it would have made no difference uh, to the future of humans as a species because young people, uh, children, people of breeding age would have been left almost entirely uh, untouched. A collapse in fertility. Um, our sperm counts are very much lower now than our grandfathers used to be and we do seem to be struggling to have children um, more. Uh, but I have a feeling uh, that we again with our vast cleverness would simply find ways of getting around this. Human beings want to have children and more specifically they want to have their own children and you know I know couples and I'm sure you do too at home uh, who have had trouble having children and so they go to the doctor and the doctor irons the path out for them. Um, it may be uh, that in the past uh, you would have to do something specific like wear a condom or whatever kind of twig which remedies um, your culture prefers to stop you having children when you had sex and in future you might have to do a few things in order to maximize your chances uh, of having children when you have sex but the point is you will still achieve it because it's one of our main aims and we will bloody well find a way. There's only really one thing that has actually shown the potential to cause human beings to evolve, if you want to call it that, um, within uh, historical memory. 
and that's the race policies of the Third Reich. There was a group of guys in Germany who decided that there was a group of people, a particular uh, genetic um, part of the human race, uh, Jews and uh, Roman Gypsies as well, and people who were of degenerate moral characters and people who had uh, diseases and Down syndrome, whatever, who would be better off out of the race for life. And this particular group, uh, the Nazis, decided that they were going to give evolution a helping hand. Now, whenever anybody talks about Nazi race ideology, they often mention people like Nietzsche, and they'll kind of mention the music of Wagner, and of course Mein Kampf, and all the rest of it. But actually, the real foundation tape of Nazi race policy was The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. It imagined a godless world, um, which therefore had no specific overarching morality, in which creatures competed tooth and nail, the winners survived and went on to improve, and the losers went by the wayside. And the uh, German high command decided that this process was a process that was not yet complete. They looked at the, you know, the German youth, and they saw them with their hair the color of hay and eyes like the sea, you know, tall and you know, robust and technologically advanced and ruthless, and they thought that is the future of human evolution. And what we need to do is clear everybody else well out of the way to provide more Liebenstrand, more living space for those kind of peoples uh, in the hope that it would improve the human race going forward. Now it's really important, I think, if you want to understand other people or achieve your aims, if your aims are to change the way that people think, to remember that no one ever really thinks of themselves as a villain. No matter how abhorrent their actions might seem to us now, uh, to them they were either good or at least justified by some overarching aim uh, or need. The Nazis, and the reason why young people in Germany were kind of swayed to that view, is because to continue evolution is merely the next step after recognising that it exists, that people are in competition, that there's only going to be room for some of us in the future, that certain alleles will fall by the wayside, and then you go, is that going to be you? And they all go, nine. And that was part of the reason why the Nazis did what they did. They saw um, uh, Hebrews, for instance, as being kind of like a subgroup of uh, humanity who are inherently parasitic, and that the world would be better off without them. Now, it's hard for us to get our minds around that now, but that is what they thought then. That was the justification for those actions. However, what the Nazis didn't manage to get their heads around was that actually there are other forces at play in the human mind than merely the desire to compete, uh, mate and survive in that prehistoric way. They didn't realise that there are other forms of weakness that they were displaying which actually marked them out as being unfit to live, and that was moral weakness. That their savagery united mankind against them, meaning that in the end it was them who were stamped out, not because they weren't, you know, you've got an extraordinarily successful group, and if you look at their kind of march across Europe and the, the ease with which the, the countries of Europe fell like dominoes, it'd be hard to come to the conclusion they didn't have something special but because other people just couldn't bear that that way of thinking should have a future on our planet. And so the world united against them, with the exception of, uh, of Japan, uh, Italy, and for a while at least Russia, and stamped them out, along with their ideology, which had done a great deal of effort then and now to, to make sure that it's portrayed as you know, very evil. You know, they're, they're the only people who are allowed to kind of like kill with impunity in films and comics and all the rest of it, because they are the bad guys. And the reason they're the bad guys isn't because they declared war in Europe, which I think we'd probably overlook, it's the fact that they had this particular race policy. So it seems to me that even if a group of humans decided that they wished to progress evolution by stamping out the weak and ensuring that they bred more successfully, what would happen is the rest of the species would turn against them, engulf them and grind them up, and they'd either learn their lesson or it would be them uh, who jumped off the race for life. So, with that as a backdrop, it's very hard to see human beings evolving much at all. If you can think of something that would pressurise us to the point at which we're on the boundaries of extinction, I can't, I have to be honest, even on this planet, I don't think we're going to, you know, even if we never go to other worlds and all the other things that people like to dream about, we will survive and we'll survive in numbers because we are literally just a cut above all other species uh, as a result of our technology. And empathy, of course, plays an enormous part in this. It's part of the reason why the Nazis failed, is because they didn't understand that human beings empathised with the weak, that they wished to support those who are being oppressed, um, 
that we just don't think in that chimpanzee-like way anymore. Now the interesting thing about that thought, which is that once you get to human intelligence, you come off the conveyor belt of evolution because your success uh, stamps out the drivers of evolution. That suggests that not only are we, if you like, the, uh, the end product of Earth's evolutionary process, that we're the final stopping point uh, for evolution, that you can go as far as us and then no further, but it also suggests that any other creatures anywhere else in the universe that develop our cognitive abilities and the empathy that seems to come along with consciousness would also stop at the same point. That suggests that we're not only the masterpiece of the Earth, but we're also probably the masterpiece uh, of the universe. That nowhere out there uh, in the distance of the stars is there that superior race uh, who people worry about. There are undoubtedly, uh, you know, there's a possibility they would have better technology, but there'd be no more uh, better than us uh, intrinsically uh, than colonialists taking their technology to sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, were better intrinsically than the people that they found there. So predicting the future of human evolution, when you consider that we could go any way, seems impossible. But actually when you consider that evolution is a process that has to have a certain number of pieces in a row, and that those pieces are no longer in a row for people, for human beings, that actually evolution for us has come to a halt and that in six million years, we'll still be much the same as we are now. It may well be uh, that the races are less clearly delineated as we mix more broadly, but those children would be no more superhuman uh, than I am subhuman, or indeed, you know, like a, a Torres Strait Islander is subhuman now. We're all human. All of our offspring will be human. Uh, and this tendency to breed more broadly to have a large population that can dominate its environment, so it always reverts back to the mean, and the fact that we are simply not being pressurised to the point of extinction and death in the same way as we would have been during our evolutionary journey, when we weren't clever enough to make our brains really count, means that I can fairly uh, certainly suggest that there won't be superhumans, we won't have amazing noses and we won't be able to run faster and we won't be able to think more uh, that will be much the same as we are now and that the future of human evolution, human evolution, much like the stromatolites of Shark Bay, is that we will continue to be human and that visitors from another planet coming down to look at our biome will look at it and they'll see us on the surface and they'll say the reason there are still human beings on that planet and the same reason that there are still stromatolites of Shark Bay is because that biome is able to support them indefinitely. So I suspect there will be no future to human evolution, that we're it, which I suppose is a, as much a cause for kind of insincere crocodile smiles as it is insincere crocodile tears. So there you have it. Tell me I'm wrong. So, very interesting. Ask it as a question. Well, my question is that um, you, you've you suggested, and I agree, that we are, to an extent, supernatural. I'm not sure that's the right term, but we've escaped the limitations of nature yes. through our brains and our grasp of technology. I agree, There's I can't envisage any um, eventuality that we can't overcome mm. through our ingenuity. Just with what we've already got. What we've already got, quite possibly. So to, to that very extent, and you kind of touched upon it when you're talking about people will need assistance increasingly to have children. Mm. Um, uh, why not, and in a case A, to like, design the perfect child. Mm. Uh, and the technology exactly comes to the, to the same question. We will have the technology, we probably already do, um, to choose eye colour. So mm. can we add 20% to muscle mass? Can we, I, want, I want a child that's going to be highly empathetic, or actually I want a, I want a psychopathic child, because yeah. they, they succeed better, yeah. in, in, in other areas. Um, and so, no, it might not be the, I'm interested in your opinion, it, it might not be the, the standard definition of evolution, mm. it's certainly a form forced of... Forced evolution. Forced, yeah. Thank so, you, let's do it. Yeah, so, so, so you know, well, what's your feedback to that? Because I, I can, okay, and also the very fact that we are, you know, like, I think it was, was it, Arthur C. Clarke or Asimov who basically said that we're going towards the end point will be a no corporal body 
it will be a consciousness or a soul, but, mm. which I view to be fundamental electricity, which is exactly what I view as the future of the internet, if you will call it mm. that, the, an ecosystem of, of energies that are individuals and we no longer need a corporate body, like the matrix almost, for example. Yeah, okay, sure. I'm heading towards that. Okay, so uh, is it running? Yeah, yeah, it's been running the whole time. Yeah. Okay, so let's, uh, so let's do that. So let's say, uh, could evolution be kick-started by um, human beings being able to choose uh, certain alleles in their offspring? Um, and uh, the assumption being, of course, that all human beings who have the ability to choose will choose specific alleles in their offspring. So it may be that, you know, like who's going to... Everybody assumes you'll choose blue eyes. Um, but... There's an interesting point there, which is that I, for instance, am obviously a Caucasian. I have two brothers. One of my brothers uh, has been married to a Korean, and he's split up with uh, with his wife, and he's now with a with a, a girl who's Hong Kong Chinese. He certainly seems to have a preference uh, for people who have dark hair and who are of Asiatic origin. Uh, my wife is from five miles down the road from where I grew up, and she's a standard Caucasian. Though as things happen, she's also of course a Dutch. Um, and then my other brother has a, has a wife who's different again. She's significantly younger than he is, whereas my wife is slightly older than I am. The fact is, is that whilst we assume, and I don't know why necessarily we assume this, that actually the things the Nazis regarded as being master race characteristics, that we all secretly also still feel that way, that that, you know, that, that Aryan Superman is what everyone would choose, given the choice. I don't think that's true. It seems to me there's someone for everyone. There are girls who like bouncers. There are other girls who like brain surgeons. There are girls who like someone who can sing. Yeah. It's like all of the various types of human being appear to have a mate who is absolutely champing at the bit to jump into bed with them. So I think for us to foresee a future in which we as a species will only select a certain limited number of alleles that will then go on to define us in future actually underestimates our, our desire to appreciate and lust after um, a whole range of peculiar things. And so if people could choose uh, the appearance of their offspring, I think the truth of the matter is, thanks to our own um, self-regard, what people most want to see in their offspring is themselves. Which is exactly why I said blue eyes, because I have, you know, starting me blue eyes. Um, but, you know, I, I you know, I, 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 my, my mate, Alice, she's got green eyes, uh, mm. which, which I find highly attractive. So, yeah, I, 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 each, for, you know, for everyone there's a different type of car or a different bicycle, I don't know, for, you know, everyone's got different proclivities mm. towards what's attractive or meaningful to them. So, yeah, I, I just want to be clarify, I'm not... I'm not supporting blue eyes as being the, uh, no, but the, the way. I, th I think the idea is that when everybody talks about, you know, kind of design of babies, is that the, the automatic assumption is that that's what they want them to look like. Because actually, generally speaking, people prefer their offspring to look like them. That's what they want. Well, totally. They want little mini-me's. They you know? want a mini-me. Yeah, so they're bringing course, up our kids, you know, don't do it like that, do it like this, because A, that's the way I've always done it, or B, that's the way I wish I could do it. Mm. So I want to pr provide an improvement to you. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so yeah. I suspect that if people were given the choice to actually say, you know, what would I like my child to be like? He said, well, I actually want it to be like me. I want it to be like um, the image of his father. I want it to be like his dad. I want it to be like, like the mum. And as long as there's variation in the parents, that means there'll be selected variation in the offspring. You may as well just bonk and see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I, I, it does, it's not really going to affect sort of traditional um, e evolution, if I can mm. call it that. Yeah. But, but you, you'll be able to affect some pretty gigantic changes to okay so that, so for example this is another question i had about this I, as i understand it the average height of humanity is increasing mm. yeah so so when you know i'm quite tall you're yeah. very tall my wife is very tall for for the for gender um so the likelihood is our, our offspring may be very tall and i'm mm. conscious of the fact that um my daughter she may be very conscious of the fact she's tall my wife sometimes hunches over because she didn't want to stand out, that's a, to do yeah. with her character. But I then I get in their heads, get in Isla's head straight away. Look, you're you're the next stage of evolution. If you're going to be okay. tall, so so what you're talking about there is not evolution. Okay. So when you talk about a population who are growing taller, so for instance, the population of Britain has been growing taller. The reason the population of Britain has been growing taller isn't because we've had an input of others from outside who brought tall genes and those others from outside are considered to be more attractive than the native Brits and so the local British women are mating with them in order to have their tall offspring. What's actually happening is the descendants of the Brits from the 1900s 
are still here with us and they've all successfully bred. But what's happening is that because we have more food, because we have better lifestyles, is that we are able to express uh, our full body size. We don't have rickets. We're not stymied um, by a kind of, you know, be hunched under sacks or buried in coal mines <laughs> or not having enough to eat. So the actual genetic mix, if you like, of, uh, of, of the Britons today is much the same as it was uh, in the past. Um, it's just that those genes have been allowed to express themselves, the outside of what they can do, because those situational pressures that would otherwise drive evolution have fallen away. So by that, by that rationale, then we will, we will uh, the wrong word is bottom out, we will top out. We'll top out. Uh, at a certain point. Yeah. So, it's, so it's, it's, not that, um, it's not that short people famously struggle to breed. We don't have uh, people who are kind of like, you know, between five foot five and, and six foot, for instance, who don't have children. Mm. You know, they do have children. It may be, for instance, that people from six foot to six foot five or six foot seven um, get what you might consider to be higher standard mates because women like tall men, if they like tall men. Um, but everybody ends up with somebody and they all then have children. And even if there's a tendency for a woman to choose a taller man, I don't see any sign that there's a specific desire on the part of most men to have an especially tall wife. Uh, a girl who's five foot two and hot as hell is going to be in demand as much as a girl who's five foot nine and hot as hell. I, I, I feel, okay, the battery's about to run out. I feel, I feel the need to contest that because when I met Alice and she was only about an inch and a half taller than me at six foot one and a half, I was like, like, for so many reasons, I was like, yes, please. You know, my girlfriend's only five foot, my wife is only five foot two. What are you saying? Nothing. <laughs> 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 okay, fine. Okay, good. Thank you very much. So that's the funeral. Oh.